Hey guys, it's Megan, and I clearly am not in my own body. I'm fuzzy and small and adorable. Look, I got turned into the- put into the body of my cat, and my cat has my body. I don't know where my actual bodies went. I'm pretty sure that if Shinya is anything like me, she's probably writing the food- where the food is. Uh, so I guess, uh, so let's see. Uh, it says to get changed back that I have to say three simple things. Okay, so the first- I can't even freaking read any of this. God d Google, can you translate this for me? Oh, I don't have my phone. All right, I guess I'm going to summarize what it says and take a guess that it says that the Dub Talk podcast may contain language that is not suitable for all audiences and that listener's discretion is advised. It's also going to say that there may be spoilers for Copcraft present as well as any and all other anime and media. And it finally says that the views and opinions expressed here do not reflect the original participants and do not reflect Dub Talk as a whole. Okay, so why am I still a cat? Oh god. Really? This is ridiculous. Oh, at least I get three square meals a day and my butt scratched. I don't like the idea of having to poop in a box. That's just gross. Anybody hear those goat noises? Oh god, Hardy got put into a body of an actual goat. Hardy's body has been possessed by an actual goat, hasn't it? Well, we all knew this day was coming. Time to train him back with the power of Paps Blue Ribbon and White Claw. Remember, kids, there ain't no law when you're drinking the claw. Hello and welcome to Dub Talk, a show where a bunch of nerds get together and talk about the latest and greatest in English dubs and voiceover. Today, we take the night patrol and warm up the Wakachiga machine for the ode to hard-boiled 70s and 80s action films, Copcraft. Does the dub go above and beyond the Call of Duty, or do we have to take its badge? Um, Chief Roots is on the case, and joining me in the investigation tonight are Deputy Megan... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm just here for the donuts. <laughs> uh, Detective Amon. Hey, who, who drank the last of the coffee, you asshole? I was going to drink that. I've been on shift since 5 in the morning. <laughs> and taking a bite out of crime, and also the police cruiser, uh, the crime prevention goat himself, Spaceman Hardy. Ugh, don't make me run, I'll get all sweaty if I run. <laughs> 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 So if the introduction there didn't tip you off, today we are taking on Copcraft. They, uh... Can we call it animated? Can we even call it animated? Um, I mean, they're if trying. books to be animated... It's, it's better doing... than Berserk, at least. Uh... Better than Ari Ferretta. <laughs> Better than Berserk, where it's basically the CG equivalent of just moving the frame up and down to convey walking. At, at least it's got those Ronge Murata character designs. Yeah, hey. that that's the big thing we should mention here, is that the, um... Probably the claim to fame here is it is one of the two shows this season that with character designs by famed... Uh, by famed Japanese artist, Range Murata. And, uh, also, the guy who wrote the light novels and then turned around and actually is doing the scripts for the series itself, uh, Shoji Gato, who you would actually recognize as the guy behind Full Metal Panic. Huh, interesting. So the show so has... Two men who, the two men who basically did sci-fi of, like, the early weeb thousands come together to make... Something that should have come from the early weep thousands. <laughs> a little bit. Shut the name. You're not wrong. <coughs> Actually, I yeah, mean, this, this would have played really well at the anime club in like 2005, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this feels like something that would have been put out in like the late 90s. It's great. Just enough edge. Makes the world go around. All right, so we have a plot description courtesy of Anime News Network. 
Uh, Fifteen years ago, an unknown hyperspace gate opened over the Pacific. Beyond the gate lies Reto Samani, a strange alternate world where fairies and demons live. San Teresa City, a city where over two million immigrants live from both worlds. As a result, there are the haves and the have-nots. Here's the world's newest city of dreams. But in the shadow of the chaos, crime is rampant. Drugs, prostitution, weapon trafficking. The detectives who stand up to these heinous crimes are the San Teresa City Police. One detective, K. Matuba, in the alternate world night, Tirana. Tilana. Tilarna. 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 God, that it's it's different on the on the A and N description. I'm sorry. Uh, two individuals who differ in gender, personality, and even world of origin meet, and an incident erupts, as they tend to do. Oops. Um, basically, Can I do the super butter buns. <laughs> Can I pull the super butter buns, please? Do it. And along the way, you'll meet fairies, drugs, fucking with the system. <laughs> Wizard potentially racist stereotypes. Mm. Uh, what else is there? Um, crashing the cars, porno, porno mags, mags. <laughs> porno mags, and a man crying about his car. <laughs> also, crime and punishment, and and politics that make you look and go, "Damn, we really haven't changed." <laughs> And holy shit, is that a vampire? <laughs> is she naked? <laughs> oh, wait, there's black smoke covering your naughty bits. He you can get this no on pants. TV. <laughs> Saw a vampire. The vampire wasn't... Man, the Baron's night out has gone a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> we drained the people. And the people were on drugs. And now I'm a wizard. <laughs> and now I'm a wizard. <laughs> you're welcome to every your every one of you're welcome fans of what we do in the shadows. Oh man. Anyway, you can take back over now, honey. <laughs> uh, and of course, since this is a dub of a Japanese animation, we have an ADR crew to talk about. Um, first and foremost, did we have any predictions? I have them. Shoot. I do. What you got? Um, so I had predictions and I changed one of them because, okay, so originally I do, I will say who the first person I had that I took away, so therefore this makes it invalid. I originally had that Jeremy Inman was going to work on this. Saw he was doing Demon Lord Retry and took him off. (laughs) Um, But I also had Mike McFarland or Tabitha Ray. And then for writers, I had Aaron Dismute, Clint Bickham, or Quentin Browning. Alright, Amon, did you have anything? No. Okay. How organized do you think I am? (laughs) (laughs) I think Walter Hill's going to do the ADR. The fact that he's never done ADR in his life is irrelevant. Uh, so for ADR scripts, I had Clayton Browning. God, I pulled, I pulled a step on this one. I had, I have a ton of different predictions for director because I it, it's basically two, but I had a director and an assistant in two different. Uh, so the first one was uh, Mike McFarlane and Felicia, because they honestly, like in terms of main director and assistant, like they've done a lot of the ones that I really liked, and because this one's kind of complicated, but because of Last Exile, they have the Silver Wing and. Chris Bevins directed that, but he no longer works at Funimation, so I went with somebody who worked with him often, which is Jeremy Inman. And then, for his assistant, I put Anthony Bowling, because he also tends to work with Jeremy Inman a lot. In terms of the actual director and scriptwriting pair, doing the scripts for Copcraft is Emily Neves, and the ADR director is Jeremy Inman. So, at Emily Neves, you would know from such shows as Double Decker, 
Kakarillo, Bed and Breakfast for Spirits, Hyoka, Pop Team Epic, and Ushio and Tora. Uh, Jeremy Inman, you would know his directorial work from Golden Kamui, Isekai Quartet, Demon Lord Retry, Midnight Occult Civil Servants, and Saga of Tanya the Evil. I think you can tell a pattern I'm going to be doing with these tonight, where it's basically shows about civil servants and isekai, because that's basically what's getting mashed up here. Alright, so I'm I'm going to start things off with Hardy. Um, mm. What do you think of the direction and script writing? Uh, script writing's a hoot, man. Um... Emily has shown that she's not afraid to get a little bit colorful with her language. And uh, and some of Kay's, Kay's one-liners are just... Mwah! Magnifique! And I'm not going to dare to steal your favorite away from you, uh, Roots. I know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> but there was one in the last episode. I forgot what it was, and it's eating me up on side. Where, um, oh, yes, or Kay and, and Talarna are having dinner right after they've busted the mayoral candidate, and she's getting really incensed at how it's so unfair and corrupt, and how the mayor is lying, and Kay just goes to her and says, I doubt even your sword could cut through bullshit that thick. God, yeah, it's wearing the eighties on its sleeve. It's <laughs> beautiful. Yeah, no, the script is an absolute hoot, and um, and cheers to Emily and and the direction. Uh, what I do appreciate, we were talking about this before we started recording, is uh, representation of people, pe- pe- persons of color, um, is more and more important these days, and I do appreciate how. Uh, most people of color in this in this uh, in this show are actually voiced by by actual uh, people of color, and uh, kudos to Inman for uh, for looking at going out for that little extra detail, and uh, and yeah, everything. There are a few iffy at performances. I think we'll talk about later, um, but as far as our main cast and crew, they're just having a ton of fun with it. They sound so fu- so nice. And uh, and so yeah, I think the direction and writing is really good. I <clears throat> how do I put this? We we were saying this is sort of a this is sort of an early mid two thousands weeb stream, you know, a joining of two great powers. But I feel that's not where the, that's not where the true soul of the show lies. This the true soul of the show lies on being run on tbs or tnt or some other tv cable station that runs action movies at 1 p.m on a sunday afternoon for your dad to watch (laughs) and i feel this dub captures that aspect very well um this is this is this is delightful i agree i think i think the casting on this is very strong uh the writing is delightful my favorite line is um there's an episode where uh our poor lead's car has been totaled uh, and he he is he is he is wailing about it because it, it's his own car because the, the the department would not give him an undercover car. But at one point, his boss the is trying. Department's to... too cheap to get him an actual car. Exactly, not even a, not even like a shitty junker to drive around. So his, his own car has been totaled in the in the in the press of the case, and he's like wailing about this in in the chief's office. And the chief's trying him to calm down. And he's like, "I am not crying." And chief is like, "You are literally weeping." <laughs> and it's just it's just just some. Just, Perfect, because I, I looked at the Japanese, and, like, the Japanese version of that line is not nearly as funny. And it's that attention to word choice that I appreciate so very much. Um, yeah, this is, this is like, this is just very delightful. Your diaper, your diaper baby shit, I think he also says. <laughs> <coughs> I am not surprised by this. This is, and this is, this is something that actually surprised me while watching it. I'm so used to seeing shows on Funimation that... Even if the show is kind of... It seems like it's aimed a little bit of an older audience. I feel like Funimation generally make a point of making their dubs very, like, PG-13. So the sheer level of swearing in this is not something I expect from them. And I feel like, no, this is very appropriate. This is very, like, 80s R-rated movie. I appreciate this. This has worked on people who, who like, oh, I can see what tone this is going for. I know how to work with that. Uh, and, like, this, 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 this show and dub is not without flaws by any stretch of the imagination, but it is a blast to listen to, uh, certainly on that side. 
So like I'm, I'm I'm very happy with this. This is this is a hoot to listen to. It's my turn. I'm so mad that I took Jeremy Inman out of my predictions for this. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. You thought you thought I could only do one show a season. I'm so mad about that. <laughs> well, it's it's it's. I know that after I know that people do multiple shows a season. I I know this, and I just didn't. For some god awful reason, I just didn't think that Jeremy was going to do two shows this season. I'm an idiot, and this is proof of it. Um, I I, I think this is the the better show that he's working on this season. So, um, I do have some some issues, some nitpicks with the secondary cast. I do they think that some of their performances are a little stiff. I don't think the accent work uh, is a little is, <laughs> is the strongest in the world in regards to one character. I will say though, I. Um, I'm I, I, sorry. You know exactly who I'm talking I, I, about. I, I have a point about that when we when we actually talk about his character, but you go on. Um, I don't, and I don't know if the accent is shitty because it's '80s movie shitty, or if it's just like this person is just not never done a Russian accent before. Um, I think that I I do really appreciate that. Um, even though some of the the black characters are kind of caricatures sometimes. That they are played by by black actors. Um, uh, just Emily's script writing is so much fun. If I can say some of my personal favorite lines, one being um, "Let's cut him open and take a selfie," <laughs> is is one of my personal favorites. Um, along with uh, there's one where one where uh, they're talking about giving uh, Talarna a license. Mm, yeah, that's one of my favorites as well. And, <laughs> Um, they're gonna let you drive. That's like giving Jeffrey Dahmer permission to open a restaurant. <laughs> um, I've been wearing this mask for the last month like an asshole. Um, the conversation that Kay has with the cop about the porn magazines is also up there. She does the show. Um, <laughs> Where he's like, the cop is like, this is some pretty kicky shit, and Kay's like, this ain't nothing. And he's like, yeah, right, well, my girlfriend would never do it. You need to get a different girlfriend. <laughs> my my favorite part of that scene Poor Kay. was when Talarna gets all flustered, like, this is vulgar. He's like, hey, your mom and dad probably did that indecent. to make you. <laughs> this is indecent. We didn't just make love, Maxie. We hooked. <laughs> Max, your mother liked to suck my dick. Yup. <laughs> I'm sorry, Aerith. It's all my fault. I yucked up. And that's what happened to your mother, Maxie. Oh, God. Look what you did. You broke roots. When we look into it, that song Powerline seeing eye to eye has a whole different meaning now. Um. <laughs> I am so sorry to everybody I just ruined Goofy Movie for. Um, <laughs> oh God, ruined it or the, made it better. What was one of the uh, There's like another one that just absolutely fucking destroyed me at one point too. Uh, one of the things I also really want to compliment is that they um, they have the actors speak the fake language of Samarian in the move in the show. Um, that's a really nice touch. They didn't just have them speak English and be like, oh, they're speaking another language. They they did the I don't think they did the devil is a part timer route. I don't know if Samanian came from the Japanese translation team. This isn't like Jamie Markey makes an entire fucking fucking thesaurus. Like remember kids, that's an actual thing that happened. Um mm-hmm. I, I I absolutely love the main two leads casting in this. I think that they are by far the biggest appeal to this show. Um I think this is a solid effort all around. Um, <coughs> I would also like to say that this this feels like it was written by somebody who watched a Law of Law and Order Criminal Intent in SVU. Specifically Criminal <laughs> Intent. Because that was the one with, um, not Christopher Maloney, but what's the other guy's name who was Kingpin? In, uh, Vincent D'Onofrio? He's Kingpin in Dare- in da- Yes! That one! Yeah, look, I'm from, my family's from New York. Like, watching Law and Order is like a rite of passage in the household. 
Also, being Law and Order SVU is in fact a vortex, and you will lose several hours of your life just watching it. That's all I have to say. I can confirm this. All right, so picking backing on what everybody else was saying, I I really do like that the casting had like a lot of representation to it, like. All of the characters of color were played by actors of color. And, like, it's, it's the, those little big things like that, that just kind of breathe a lot of life into the stub. Not to mention, they actually took the time to, I want to say this is, Whatever the syllabic root of the Samanian language that they use in the Japanese version is being carried over in the English dub, I'm not 100% sure on that. And I, like, if there's one thing, if I ever get the chance to pick Jeremy and Min's brain about this dub, I, that is the one thing I really want to know is, like, how they got the Samanian language across. Because it doesn't sound like one of those, you know, you take a couple consonants, switch them around, leave the leave the vowels in place kind of deal like they had with um, Devil is a Part-Timer. Which, in and of itself, like, that was really impressive. But, that's really great. And, mm, like, the script writing just bleeds those... 70s and 80s hard-boiled cop movies. Like, if this were closer to December, I could hear those scripts just singing, Die Hard is here, Die Hard is here, Die Hard is here, Die Hard is here. <laughs> like, um... Like that one When do we throw an Alan Rickman out of building? China, Illinois. But this just feels... It feels like... If Die Hard had a fantasy alternate world spinoff. Like, all of the cops are busting each other's chops. Oh, God. Well, I mean, I guess I'll say the one line that we all... I know why you're all here. You're waiting for Roots of Justice <laughs> to say, Satan can suck my dick. <laughs> now what about those 50-inch televisions? God bless. Like, as much as I'm not necessarily a big fan of police brutality, the whole thing in episode 4, toward the tail end, where they're... where Kay and Tilarna are formerly partners, and Tilarna goes a bit too far. And cuts like the that, dude's finger off? Yeah, the... the entire chop-busting scene between Kay, Tilarna, and Bill Zimmer, who we'll get to here in a couple minutes, like... I thought that was really well done. Casting was really great. Direction's really great. And the scripts are just that right level of 80s cheese. Like, I there's not a lot of bad I could say about the technical side of the Copcraft Up. So, with that, we will move on to our first batch of characters... Uh, first and foremost is Jack Roth, who is the original police chief of the San Teresa police force. It turns out he doesn't have the best of intentions for human Samanian relations. He's basically trying to incite an incident that will drive the two races apart so that the Samanians will basically go home. Uh, we also have Cecil Epps, who works for the morgue of San Teresa, and is also the former... I don't know if it was ever explicitly stated if she was Kay's ex-wife or girlfriend, but it's they were in a romantic relationship. Okay. Uh, they were in a romantic relationship together. They are no longer. For the most part, they seem like they're still relatively chill and professional with each other, so... There's that. And then Bill Zimmer, who is the new police chief after Jack Roth is killed in episode three. 
He is very harsh towards Kay and Talarna at first, but by episode 5 and 6, after Talarna saves the life of a couple of his of his officers during a vampire attack, which is a thing that happens in this show, uh, he ends up warming up to the two a bit. Um, I'm assuming no predictions for no. these three. No, I will be perfectly upfront with you. I actually did have... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I actually did have one for uh, Cecil. <laughs> Okay, so did I. What do you have? Wait, what, what, what was Hardy saying? No, I was just going to just come right out and say, very, very upfront, the only predictions I made were for Kay and Talarna, so we'll get to that when I get to him. Yeah, I have a couple scattered throughout the episode. I have, a, I have like, four, but uh, for uh, Su- Su- Cecil, Cecil, I had uh, Colleen, Clinkabeard, or Caitlin Glass. Okay. And, uh, for me, again, uh, Cecil was the only character I actually did a prediction for. I had Morgan Garrett. Playing these three characters, um, we have, as Jack Roth, Andy Mullins. As Cecil Epps, we have Afia Yu. And as Bill Zimmer, we have Gabe Kunda. Uh, you would know Andy Mullins as Don Cornello in the Full Metal Alchemist franchise. Uh, Fogel in Legend of Galactic Heroes, Dinoya Tessa. Uh, he was both Don Krieg and Wapole in the One Piece franchise. And Venturi Leroy in Space Battleship Tiramisu. Afia Yu, you would know as Victory de Blois in Gosik. Uh, Rita in Rage of Bahamut Genesis. Uh, Clara Kisenaria from Very Gone. And Spinel Sun in Cardcaptor Sakura Clear Card. Uh, Gabe Kunda, uh, ooh, this one's, this one's kind of a strange name, um, Kujapat, I think is how you pronounce that, um, from the new Code Geass movie. Uh, he was Derek Ross in Double Decker, he was Key in non and this season you can hear him as Bem in Bem. All right, so, Hardy, uh, what did you think of this first batch of characters? Uh, First of all, I think Andy Mullins was not the best in this performance. Sounded kind of forced to me. Um, Maybe it was just a bad bad reading, but I wasn't really really the biggest fan of the first Chief. Um... As with Afia, this is a kind of character that she doesn't really get to play very often. And so I was kind of kind of taken aback at first, but it grew on me. And it's it's a it's a serviceable performance. You know, it's it's not what we we really know Afia to, to usually portray, but she did a fair enough job. Bill Zimmer is quite hilarious as the new chief. (laughs) Because he is pretty much every single stereotypical uh, chief of police from all the cop buddy movies you've ever watched growing up, ever. And he just brings that energy into the room and just, you know, you can almost expect to hear him say, Toss it! I want your gun and your badge right now! In my office, pronto! Kowalski! I told you that's my, my name, sir. But anyways, yeah, um, that's my thoughts, is that Bill Zimmer of the three is probably the strongest performance. Or the one that I like the most. Let's see. Uh, I thought I thought Eddie Mullins was, um, I thought at least he was probably fine as Jack Roth, although I admit at this point it's been a while since I saw the episodes he was in, and he had, his, the distinction of his performance has faded a little bit. Um, I thought he was, he, he was, he was very solid. Um if maybe not nothing to write home about. And I think he probably suffers from the fact that his replacement in the show is a lot more memorable. Uh, we'll get to him in a minute. Um, I, I've been enjoying Afia as Cecil, um, as uh, Cecil Epps. Um, it's, it's just like, it's a nice, good, strong performance. I think it's, it's it sits the character well. I particularly liked the bit where um, 
she's teaching she's teaching Tirana how to drive and kind of like talking about like oh I'm I'm his ex girlfriend she's like that's what that means oh no I don't want to give you the wrong idea about what my relationship is it's like no no I understand don't worry about him he's just kind of a bozo um yeah, I, th- I thought that you know it's a, it's a good uh, Cecil doesn't show up too much but uh, I think Afia has been given some chance to shine a little bit when she does. But let's talk about the real, the real hero of this group, Gabe Kunda, as the police chief. He is police chief, never police chief. <laughs> he is so good. I, 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 I like. I, I immediately fell in love with his performance the first minute he shows up. He's such a. It's a. It's such a perfect encapsulation of that sort of like, angry, you know, angry, loud, authoritarian. Oh, like, I'm, I'm waiting for the point in the show when shit gets real and he actually demands they turn into their gun and badge. Uh, I'm looking forward. Like, I, I, exactly. It's just like I know that's going to happen, and I'm so looking forward to it because it's going to be so great. Um, he's just he's just he's just very deeply, sincerely entertaining. Also, I had not realized he he plays Bem in Bem, which I'm also watching this season. Uh, that's a range. Kudos on that. I don't know if we're going to do a Bem episode, so I'm going to get my phrase in here for that one. Um, yeah, he's it's he's really he's just, he's just really. Yeah, no. <laughs> it'll be a good time when you do. Um, you know, he he is just he is phenomenally entertaining. I'm kind of I'm kind of I'm kind of happy that his character is in the show now because he's way more fun than Jack Roth ever was, <laughs> even outside of not being a horrible traitor. Um, yeah, no, he he's 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 delightful. Big fan. Okay, can you remind me who plays the? I'm sorry, I'm blinking out. Who plays uh, Jack again? Uh, Andy Mullins. Okay, he was by far, I think, the weakest performance in the show for me. Oh my god, there's a bug on my computer screen. Um, it's like a little gnat. Um, I felt at times he was very stiff, especially in the whole emotional reveal. That he was the one leaking information about the kidnapped fairy, and... He has this really emotional moment where, like, Kay is like, you were like a father to me. And he's just like, yeah. I, like, it just didn't work for me. I didn't think he, he hit the payoff of that emotionally. Like, uh, let's say, like, Kay or Talarna's actors did the next episode when they had a huge moment between each other. Um, I just thought that he was very he was very much stiff and just kind of like, eh. Uh, didn't expect Afia to be uh, Cecil. Um... I like it. I think that she she brings kind of like she sounds younger, but not like a kid. Um, she also gets to deliver one of my favorite lines, which is the cutting people open line and taking a selfie. Um, I think that she gets all the medical jargon down without sounding like too in like too like by the book. Um, I think that she she's she's a solid choice. Maybe not the best I've heard out of her. Uh, before, but I think she's solid. And then Gabe Kunda's Bill is just a fucking trip. Just, he sounds like he walked out of a fuck. he sounds like he walked out of, like, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Um, <laughs> he, he sounds like he's gonna ask Kay why he's a bitch. Um, absolute, like, trip to listen to. Uh, just, when, when he's trying to calm down Kay about the fucking the fucking car is great and when uh oh some superintendent tries to to yell at Talarna and he's like what the hell is your problem like he sounds like a police chief and it's great that was the moment Bill Zimmer endeared on me like he went from being like kind of an asshole to the asshole that the asshole dad that you love so I thought he was he was great I thought he's such a fun I I liked him the most out of the so. All right, so I guess I'll start with um, Andy Mullins as Jack Roth. I, like everybody else, I, I kind of agree that his performance was probably one of the weaker ones of the show. Uh, I kind of, I kind of attribute that to just he's not in the show a lot, like just the first three episodes, and even then he just kind of. Shows up until his big reveal at the end. Um, I I think Andy Mullins did a pretty decent job of playing a police chief pretty much by the book. 
Like everything is everything is to the to the code, but at the same time he he'll step in and kind of defend his <clears throat> he'll step in and defend his own when he needs to. Except when you know that's just a cover for what he's actually up to. But I do think a few moments were stiff, particularly, as Megan said, in the moment where he is confronting Kei Matoba about his true intentions with the plan to set off a massive bomb that is made out of the body of a fairy. That is another thing that happens in this show. I want to like it because I, I do actually have fond memories of Andy Mullins' Don Cornello. But, you know, if... I'm just kind of hoping that a few of the the weaker moments he has in the show were just like bad line bad line reads. So um I'm actually like everybody else kind of legit surprised that Afia Yu is actually playing an adult character in the show. Like she actually does she nails a lot of Cecil's quips as well. Which is great. She she gets a lot of great one-liners with him, with Talarna, particularly with the... Oh yeah, if he dies, we'll cut him open and we'll take a selfie. And then it actually shows a shot of him on the table with like a blurred out, sliced open portion. They're doing like the heart thing with their hands. It's great. This show's a riot. She gets a really comedic moments with Cecil. And then, in particular... Episodes 4 and 5 with the story arc with the vampire. Where she is actually, like, in a lot of danger. Like, Afia really did a great job with that, too. And, um... Let's get to the reason why we're here. Gabe Kunda as Bill Zimmer. Like, this may be one of my favorite performances of the show. And it took a little while for it to endear to me. Like, I I got a lot of diehard vibes from him. Like, episodes 5 and 6 where basically the shit is hitting the fan with the, the vampire attacking the city. But, I... I also really particularly like the... The aftermath of Talarna crashing Kay's car and basically him trying to snap Kay out of it. Like, he, he's not afraid to bust chops. Which is a phrase I've been using a lot, but... Like, that's a thing that happens in cop shows. Like, everybody's busting everybody's chops. But he... He gets a lot of these great quips and one-liners, and it's... It, all three of these performances I kind of like to some degree. Jack Roth... Maybe not quite so much in the emotional scenes, but, like, there was something here I liked out of everybody. Uh, so moving on, we have a few more members of the, uh, San Teresa Police Department precinct. Um, we have partners Tony McBee and Alexander Godnov, who don't show up very much until episode 6 with the, uh, with the porn trafficking case. Where they get have some I of the have best Have I mentioned stuff. I'm heterosexual today? <laughs> Which I I should probably also mention that Tony McPhee is canonically gay. And he has to... He has to do an undercover sting operation where he is trying to bust a Simonian trying to smuggle porn back to his own world. And it's one of, it is just one of these absolutely brilliantly comedic subplots. I love it. It's great. But um, McLeod. <laughs> <laughs> Since um, none of us really have predictions for either of them, they they were sort of characters that I didn't even see really get announced in the press release, but. Episode 6 endear me to the point that I really wanted to put them in here. But in any case, uh, Tony McBee is played by Anthony Bowling. 
And uh, Alexander Godnov is played by Jacob Browning. Uh, Anthony Bowling, you would know as uh, Shiro Ashiya, a.k.a. LCL in The Devil is a Part-Timer. Uh, he My is husband. Sadler in How... <laughs> He is Sadler in How Not to Summon a Demon Lord. Um, Isaac Duncan Drake in the Saga of Tanya the Evil. And he is Ukio in Samurai 7. Uh, Jacob Browning is uh, Susumu Kitamochi in All Out. He is Takuya Nabashima in Cheer Boys. Keigo Ishida in My First Girlfriend is a Gal. And... Like, to be honest, he doesn't have a lot of, like, major named roles listed on ANN, so he is also the character Anubis in the video game Smite. Uh, so, Hardy, why don't you start us off? Uh, perfectly honest, I honestly, honest to God, do not remember a single thing about Alexander. Like, at all. Hmm. I He's must have been half asleep Russian. while the... He is big in Russian, yeah. So I I can't really judge him by his performance. Uh, Tony McBee, uh, or Anthony Bowling, rather, as Tony McBee. Uh, I know Tony is kind of a stereotypically effeminate character, which I know they're trying to generally move away from. But uh, but he it is what he is, and... You can tell Anthony's having a whole lot of fun with it because he, he he's got this he's got the he could do the stereotypical effeminacy down but then Tony also has to put on like this manly front like you know hey we got your goods where's the buddy and um and just watching him go back and forth go from from this you know mobster sort of guy to ooh it got in my hair um sort of <laughs> sort of thing and uh, it's it's entertaining for sure. Where do I start, uh, M- Megan? You 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 mentioned there is a, there is a, a character whose accent you want to talk about. Do you want me to leave that for you to discuss in your section? I mean, you can also do you can also talk about it too, man. I'm, it's up to you, my dude. So, so I'm sorry. Who uh, who who played who played Good Knob again? Uh, Jacob Browning. Thank you. So, so I I, I, I like Megan. I'm a little Jacob Braddock, who's playing uh, good enough with this stereotypical sort of Russian Soviet accent. I like Megan. I am on the fence. I can't tell if it's bad because Jacob hasn't done a lot of Russian accents, or it's bad because it's supposed to sound like a bad Russian accent. I can't quite decide <laughs> because having it's it's an '80s cop show. Having someone with a really unconvincing Russian accent fits right in there. Makes complete sense. Basically par for the course. It's like, look, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is like, it was the 80s, man. The most famous Russian in movies was played by a Swede. No one cared. <laughs> um, by who? <laughs> um, uh, what's his name? Yeah, Dolph thank you. Lundgren? Dolph Lundgren's like Swedish. Yeah. Hey, oh, God. I, I, I was... Oh shit! I was just dead. The name out of my ass. Dolph Wait, Lundgren's not dead. Happen? Dolph Lundgren died like really recently, like a couple weeks what? ago. Dolph Lundgren is dead. Yeah. I'm looking Bullshit. this. Up. I'm, I'm hitting Wikipedia right now. We we apologize, we apologize for a pause in our. Uh... I'm not seeing anything. Dolph Lundgren ain't dead. Are you sure you're not Dolph thinking Lundgren's someone else? Dolph Lundgren's still alive. <laughs> Dolph Lundgren is 61 years old. I would have been really disappointed if I found out Dolph Lundgren had been dead for three weeks and I hadn't noticed. That would have anyway. just been a really weird thing to like have on the episode. Oh yeah, by the way, Dolph Lundgren said, wait, what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, 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 no. Shit. No, I wasn't thinking of Dolph Lundgren. Oh. Uh, what's his name? Um... Uh, Blade Runner. Oh, Rucker Hauer. Yes, Rucker he did Hauer. Pass. Thank you. That he did pass away, which is which sucks because Rucker's great. But um, I had a point I was making. Um, Jake Jacob, he, I, I'll be honest. The the fact that it's so kind of obviously fake is kind of I, I kind of love that. <laughs> it, there's there's a very like 
if Copcraft were an actual 80s buddy cop movie, it, it would it would be on the scale of Lethal Weapon to a Samurai Cop. It's not <laughs> quite Samurai Cop bad, but I think it's it's definitely a little like on a certain level it's it's sort of you can tell this are like a real movie, like kind of budget wise and so on to be a little closer to that end of the spectrum. And the, the hokey hokey not very good Russian accent kind of kind of fits in for me in that regard. It's like, ah yes. I too will not cast actual Russian people because Cold War. I understand this. Samurai um, Cop. I understood that reference. <laughs> you're welcome. <coughs> um, I consequently like. I actually really enjoy this performance for that reason. It feels appropriately cheesy for the material they're covering, um, and like as a consequence, it was not like distracting for me personally. Um, I know you like. I, I feel like even even holding a bad accent consistently in your line readings is difficult. So um, kudos to him. I feel like he 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 fits in very nicely. Um, and Anthony as Tony. I could go into here about how I feel like the, the politics of the show are kind of weird because they're not they're not like hateful regressive. They're just like we didn't think very hard about any of this regressive. <laughs> We're just going to use that trope that's already there. Um. And Tony kind of feels like that, because I don't think he's an object of mockery, but he's still, you know, he's very stereotypical, effeminate gay man kind of thing. But I do think, uh, Anthony, I think, plays the character pretty well. Um, he's very entertaining. I think he, he as a performance, kind of does a good job of, like, fitting into that character without getting, like, too grotesque about it. I didn't feel, like, uncomfortable watching it. Um, and when he has to, when he has to become McLeod. He's very... <laughs> he's just, he's very... It's like, uh, it's just, you know, it's just like... You so it's like you know the more you hate doing this, the better you are at it. <laughs> it's just like he's 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 very he's very he's very good in this role. He's he's very entertaining. Um, he he, had, he adds the the kind of punch and snap to it that I think um a lot of these like sort of more goofball side characters are kind of supposed to um you know they, they, he he gets the flavoring down, which I think is very important. Um, so yeah, like I, I I enjoy both of these roles. Good stuff. Oh god. So I I I legitimately had no idea that was Jacob Browning. He's a very sweet man. I've we've I've met him. He's a really nice guy. Um I I was like, who the fuck is this dude? And like I I and like I said, I don't know if the accent is on purposely like not very good. So I don't know how to feel. I'm very confused. My Russian boner is very confused. <laughs> um, it doesn't know it, it doesn't know if we're capitalist or communist right now. Um just <laughs> Good night, that is the worst joke I've made this year. Um <laughs> Goodbye, I'm going to hell. See you all there. Uh Please oh. do not start an uh, international uh, incident. We're Vladimir Putin Mr. Poutine is gonna come from the dumbbells episode and kick my ass. <laughs> no, no, not the bear, not the horse, not the shirtless. Ah! <laughs> Please, God, no! I don't want to see the things that Sarah Palin can see from her house. Sorry. Anyway, I th I thought he was fun. I thought he balanced off of Anthony Bowling well. Um, I actually never felt like. Anthony Bowling played him, like, as the stereotypical, like, hey guys, gay voice. Like, that is my benchmark for bad gay character voice. Unless it's, like, an intentional comedy thing. Because, like, let's let's go with this. Kids on the Slope has scarred me. Kids on the Slope has scarred me. For that reason. Um, but man... I think my favorite thing about Anthony Bowling's performance is not him when he's just, like, like Tony. To which the line is, oh, how could anybody ever be into this? Sex is supposed to be something that's cherished between two people and romantic. Which I thought was really sweet. Which I thought was super sweet because, like, a lot of media usually portrays gay men as, like, ultra, like, promiscuous and not like that. So it was actually really nice to see that, like, actual Tony was, like, no, a sweet romantic, but McCloud, his ultra-heterosexual, like, uh, <laughs> undercover thing was, like, ultra-horny Chad. The ultra-horny, like, it's not gay, it's Shinji's mom. 
He's the guy who's like, he's the guy who's like, it's not gay our dicks didn't touch. It's Just, not gay if it's a two-way. He has lines, like, he has a line in the two show, bros like, you know, that shit makes my, go, my cock. Five feet apart because they're not bros, gay. Sitting, not gay. No, he has a line as McLeod that is like, what was it? You know, that thing makes me go from six to midnight, right? <laughs> and I'm just like, holy shit! Is this what, like, I I like that? How this is what a gay man thinks that straight men sounds like, and he's not wrong. I say that in the presence of three straight men. It's not an incorrect assessment on his part. <laughs> Some might even say it's a correct assessment like, on his part. McCloud is the guy who yells there's no laws while you're drinking the claw. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. That that I, man. I got to I got I got to chime in um because I was at the liquor store the other day and they're stocked <laughs> up on white claw over in the corner. And I asked him and just out of curiosity, I mean, how popular is it? How well does it sell? He's told me it sells like crazy. People are nuts for this stuff. I don't get it's it. It's like the Paps. I, it's like the Paps Blue Ribbon of upper class white boys. I'm not wrong. It's like, just, no, it's I mean, weak seltzer that tastes like booze. Nothing. It, tastes it has like no nothing. taste. We had Jamal test it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, no. back on track. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Artie. Hardy, go ahead. No, I was just... Uh, it's It's got to be something... It's so bad that even Zima tastes better. Mm. God. I can only imagine Zima. That was before my time. Mm. Damn. Anyway, I, I'm good. I, I absolutely... Like, this isn't my favorite Anthony perfor- Bowling performance of the season. I know where that is. Everybody who knows me knows where that is. But I can't talk about mm-hmm. that yet. Soon. Soon. Anyway, go ahead. Yes. Soon. God, I'm I'm still kind of reeling from that Samurai Cop reference because now all I'm thinking <laughs> of is there's a Tums festival in my stomach. But if, um, we, if we if we say if we see Gabe Kunda at a convention, we should try and get a recording of him saying that. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Oh my god, but um. Alexander Godnov, like everyone else, I get the feeling that the kind of fake Russian accent is kind of done intentionally to sort of lampoon just the the Russian guy of 80s movie pop culture. Which, I mean, all things considered, like, Stranger Things 3 literally just happened, and... <laughs> Like, fake Ruski mania is, like, all over the place right now. Justice for Alexi. But, um... Um... I... I like the fact that he's basically playing straight man to Anthony Bowling's Tony. Which, on his end, I like the fact that he plays Tony McBee as... As a gay man, but not, like... He's not absolutely flamboyant. It's just a part of his character's personality, and it's... He just plays it off as that. Like, I I really like that. Like Megan said, I really like that line where he's looking at the poor and he's just like, how can people like this? Like, love is supposed to be something... uh, Sex is supposed to be something beautiful out of love and all that. Like, I really like that. And then... Just McCloud. I I kind of want the Copcraft crew to, after production of Copcraft is done, come back in like two years with a McCloud spinoff. Just call it <laughs> McCloud. And just lampoon like every 80s 
cop movie stereotype imaginable and just have an absolute ball with it. I would watch it. Can we, can we get an unofficial crossover with actual TV cop show McLeod? <laughs> That yes. I that I mostly know from a from a consistent reference on uh, MST3K from back in the day. But um, in all seriousness, Qu- I like question. Uh, yeah, in that crossover mm-hmm. though, can Fox McCloud show up at one point? Of course, this will be horrendously unlikely. You got to use the boost to get through. <laughs> you got to use the boost to get through. Yeah, but final no weapons, final destination only. <laughs> damn it. God damn it. Out. out. God damn You're it. out of let, Evo. God, God damn it. Who let the brawl player into the episode? GameCube, out. Melee, in. I have been banned from Evo. <laughs> Alright, anyway. Anyway, back on track. Um, I I really like the dynamic of Anthony Bowling and Jacob Browning. The part that makes Tony and Alexander work really well is both of their dub actors give a lot of chemistry toward the the interactions that you have. I I really like it, and I I segued off of McCloud, but like I I just love that stereotypically heterosexual kind of accent he gives and just just that fake machismo like I I really like them and performances were great would you say it's rad oh absolutely totally rad alright so next up um we have Kay's informant on on many, many cases involving the criminal underworld of Santa Teresa and his right-hand man, um, Brother Biz O'Neill, who dresses like a preacher, uh, has a lot of kids who basically run out and do petty crimes for him, and he acts as their fence. Mm-hmm. And his right man, right hand man, Kenny. Yeah, they own a strip club that's named after like the church or something like that. Uh, did anyone have any predictions for these two? I did not. I did neither not. did I. Mm-hmm. Okay. Then in that case, uh, Biz O'Neill is played by Christopher Dontrell Piper, and Kenny is played by Randy E. Aguabor. Uh, you would know Christopher Dontrell Piper as the other Hardy in Garo Vanishing Line. <laughs> <laughs> His name is also Hardy. <laughs> uh, he played Dispo in Dragon Ball Super. And Fucking I think rabbit. his episodes were, like, really recently, too. Yep. Where Gohan gets like, jobbed he... again. <laughs> Didn't he, like, just get eliminated from the Tournament of Power? Or is that mm-hmm. still going on? I, I don't have Toonami anymore, so I don't know. He got eliminated He got eliminated the night that we were in A-Fest, so it okay. was a couple of weeks ago. Okay, he, I yeah, must Gohan have missed the part jobbed. where he got eliminated. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, Dispo in Dragon Ball Super, as I mentioned, and um, he was also... I want to say the MC that... Um, that introduces uh, Master Lord Majesty in Radiant. Uh, he he was credited as MC, and I'm I'm assuming that was that was what that was because I think Episode Five is where they introduce Master Lord Majesty. Anyway, but um, Randy Agabor, you would know as the horse in Juni Tyson. Uh, he was Inori Hikari in Nanbaka. Uh, Shirin Tiam in Black Clover, and Nasamasa Mora in My Hero Academia. All right, Hardy, what do you think mm-hmm. of these two? Well, uh, Kenny doesn't get to say much. Kenny just basically is just stands there and gets threatened by a little girl. So, well, he does. Um, 
but I mean, Randy definitely is a big guy, and Kenny is a big guy, and he makes Kenny sound like a big guy. So he does his job very ac- accurately. Um, Biz O'Neill, though, I know some people might find this certain performance controversial, but considering the character, I think that Christopher plays him absolutely perfectly. Um, Because you could tell this this guy, he dresses like a preacher, you know, he he talks a big game, and, and, you know... In reality, he's just he's just a slime ball of the highest degree. But he he knows how to. Uh, he's got good info. Let's say, and he's got those fifty inch televisions too. <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah. Even though some people I think might have a problem with it, I think Chris's performance was a whole lot of fun as Biz. He's just, you know, that sort of huggy bear, uh, stereotypical informant guy. That you just you know is a piece of slime, but you know you can't help but love him. So that's my that's my thing. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Uh, I kind of agree. Um, uh, Ra- Randy is he's good as Kenny because you know Randy's got that nice deep grumble of a voice, um, which is clearly what Kenny's called for. Um, I agree. He doesn't get to do a lot, which I always think is a shame. I feel like Randy usually gets cast. He mostly gets cast in roles that take advantage of the fact that he's naturally got that very like deep, gravelly voice. Uh, which is sad because I've seen him. He he does some live action acting, and I've seen some stuff he is absolutely hysterical in. And I wish Funimation would cast him in things that take advantage of that. Uh, and he's a wrestler too. Wait, really? He's a professional wait, wrestler. Oh my oh, god, that's wow. amazing! I didn't that's, know that. Are you cool. fucking kidding me? Yeah. Yeah, he's no, he's strictly indie, like like low, um, like uh, not not anything big. But yeah, he's a pro wrestler. That's amazing. That's, I love this that's really cool. Now. Okay, but would he be in Kaiju Big Battle? Would this I man think do he Kaiju would absolutely. Fuck yeah! Yes, I I, I have <laughs> look look. I have se- I've seen a uh, I think it was a, it was a pilot for Adult Swim that he was in that didn't get picked up called Hunky Boys Go Ding Dong. <laughs> um, <laughs> He, he, Derek Mears, and Emo Phillips uh, are all weirdo bachelors and decide to try and get a date by going on a dating game show called Don't Die Alone. And I feel like the fact that he would agree to do something like that suggests, yeah, he do kind of big battle. That's... Okay, from that title alone, I need to find this and check it out. I think it's on Vimeo or YouTube. Go, go watch it. You'd like it. You'd like it. Um, but yeah, he, he is, he does not give it a lot to do as Kenny, but he does his role very well. Um, and I agree, uh, Chris- Christopher is, he's a lot of fun as Biz O'Neill. Like, I-, I agree, I think, like, Biz O'Neill, like, he's he's definitely a little bit of a stereotype. I think the fact that he is played by an actual black actor does take some of the weirdness off it a little bit. Um, but as I said, he's, he's clearly having a lot of fun playing that role, and I think that does shine through. Um, he's, clearly, like, he's giving this all, he's hamming it up in the right ways, he's really entertaining to listen to. Um, I, I look forward to him showing up in more episodes, hopefully, because he's he's a, he's just a nice little bright spot. He's always he always seems very game to play this sort of outrageous semi preacher kind of guy. He's a lot of fun. Hold, hold on a second. Are you um, good? Uh, no. So I don't have a lot to say about Kenny. He's the big guy. He's a little stiff, but I think it's because that character is really stiff. I feel a little bit. He's not as stiff as Jack to me, but I don't have a lot to say. Sorry, Randy. I'm always really sad because I'm usually like the person like, why is it Randy Agabor and more shit? Um, Christopher Dontrell Piper, who is somebody I have be- I I have to bite my tongue because I'm on the other show that he's in this season that I can't talk about. Um, but I I've genuinely enjoyed listening to him. Um, in when I have the unfortunate chance of hearing DB Super, because I don't really like Dragon Ball guys, um, but I thought he, I think he's fucking hysterical as Biz, who sounds like he would go on the TV and trick your okay, I hate to bring politics into this, but do y'all remember when John Oliver did the, uh, the fake church bit on last week tonight? Yeah. Where they only ended up closing it down not because, like, people were sending, like, a ton of money. Not because somebody sent them a giant wooden dick. 
<laughs> okay, like if you've never seen if you've never seen the segment, essentially what it is is that John Oliver calls out uh, the prosperity gospel. Like you know, the people who's just like the churches which Biz O'Neill would one hundred percent run in in this universe. Of the, send your 1999 to my church and God will bless you in heaven and all that shit. You know, the stuff that Martin Luther posted 95 thesis on a, 99 thesis on a church door for. Um, but John Oliver did an entire segment calling that out. And uh, he ended up finding a loophole where he, in fact, could make a fake church. And um, he did. And they ran it for a while and they got, like, a bunch of money and they donated it all to charity. But uh, th- when they're like, the reason they had to close it down was that like people had been sending money. Some people sent bird seed because it was like, send us your seed. Somebody sent them a giant wooden dick. But the reason they had to stop <laughs> it was that people had actually sent them semen. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, I forgot about that. And that's why they had to tear it all down. Um... <laughs> I implore you to please look up both of the segments. They are fantastic. (coughs) But he plays Biz O'Neill. Like, Biz O'Neill is, like, tricking your mom into sending money off to, like, some crazy infomercial scam. And, like, the one thing is, too, though, is, like, he 100% cares for Tilarna, though. Because he calls Kay when she gets kidnapped. Like... I'm actually kind of sad that Biz hasn't showed up more often. I fucking love him. Like, Biz is a piece of shit, but Christopher plays him with such charisma and pizzazz that it is just, like, chef's kiss. It's probably my third favorite performance in the show. And that's all I got Hmm. to say. Okay. But yeah, somebody did, people did, people did actually send John Oliver their semen. Alright, so, not much to say about Randy Agobor as Kenny, but I do like the fact that, you know, he plays Kenny as kind of a big dude, but he also, he softens up to Talarna, like, quite a bit over the course of the show, and I, I just, when she ends up going missing, like, Kenny is the one that sends Kay the information about what's going on. So I I really like that he's this big guy and he's just kind of softening up to this this warrior knight who's kind of in the body of a body of a teenage girl and it's like I I for some reason I just really get a chuckle out of that dynamic. But um Christopher Dontrell Piper as Biz O'Neill, my god. Um, first and foremost, when I saw the, uh, the cast announcement, which was, like, a day before the dub premiered, um, I was a little worried that he was going to play Biz with sort of that, that Miss Cleo sort of accent. If you remember that from, like, the 90s, the, um... Like a, like a deep Haitian accent? Right, right. Like, that deep... Caribbean, like, running a fake psychic line to scam you out of your money. But right. I I love the fact that he plays, uh, he plays Bill, uh, he plays Biz, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, with sort of the charisma of a prosperity preacher, and it's, like, it's just so good, because he's... He's talking about these, about the, the, the crimes that he's basically fencing for as if, like, they are acts of the Lord. And, like, just that smooth talking is, it's wonderful, and he just chews every ounce of scenery he gets access to, and it's, it's just chef kiss. Like... His interactions with Kay, his interactions with Tony, yeah, his interactions with Tony in episode six, where he's helping to, um, helping to bust the porn smuggling ring. Like, 
all of these little interactions that he gets over the course of the show are just an absolute treat. I hope there are more in the second half of the show. And just... I like the both of them. And I also really appreciate that they are... They are black characters being played by black actors. Which... In the world of anime dubbing... It's it's not as common a thing as you would like to think. And I just... I really appreciate the extra mile that went into that. So, kudos. Great performances all around. Good times. And next up... Well, while Biz and Kenny were sort of morally ambiguous... Now we get to the actual bad guys of the show. That have been shown so far. Dennis Elbaji is... A uh, Samanian commoner... Who learns the language of money. And begins smuggling... Begins smuggling goods from his world to ours... In order to make a lot of it. And he gets very rich and very powerful... And he ends up smuggling a fairy for the purposes of creating a creating a bomb that will release a drug that will turn everybody in a radius around the blast into essentially zombies. This is another thing that happens over the course of this show. Yes, we have fairy nukes. Fairy nukes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Aiding him is a wizard by the name of Zelata. He is an old man. He has also encountered K. Matoba before when um, uh, when Samani and Earth were at war. Uh, not much has been discussed so far over the course of the show about what happened during this war, but it apparently has it has occurred, and something happened there that traumatized K to the point where. He has PTSD episodes. And Zalata is a wizard who is able to use the drug created by this fairy in order to basically control a human being to the point where he can... He can basically force somebody to commit murder and then suicide. Like, it... Like, that scene in episode, I want to say it was either... Yeah, I think it was two where he shows up. And he's just controlling the cops like puppets. And just the music that plays in the background. Everybody laughing in the background. And then just the sound of a gunshot. Like, that was that was some eerie shit. Um, I actually do have predictions for these two. Does anybody else? I actually do. Alright, um... Surprise, I did. So... <laughs> uh, I spelled Zalata wrong. I thought his name was Zatara or some shit. <laughs> but I had Kenny that Green happens. or Kent Williams, and then for uh, and then for uh, the, the 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 fucking white boy, um, Dennis. <laughs> the fuck kind of name is Dennis? <laughs> My name is. De- I'm from a mythical fairyland. My name is Dennis. Someone lost. <laughs> someone lost the naming lottery. I had Damon Mills or Eric Vale. Hmm. All right. So allow me mm. to pull up my predictions on my phone. Seriously, his name is fucking Dennis. <laughs> I feel like he's he should be pestering a guy named Mister Wilson. Preferably knocking his false teeth into a sink and shattering them. That is like... I s- and then replacing I, the teeth yeah. with like, um... Oh, what what is that candy? Uh, chiclets. Chiclets, yeah. No, I had a different Dennis in mind. I was wondering if this Dennis also goes by the Dennis system. <laughs> um, so... For my predictions for, uh, Mr. Zalata, I had, um, Randy Perlman... Because I, like, I really like Randy Perlman's voice, and, like, and, like, Akka and all that. And for Dennis Obaji, who is sort of 
really charismatic, really, really kind of a playboy. Douchey. Yeah, essentially douchey. He's a Chad. Pretty much. Um, I actually had two here, and that was either um, Josh Greeley or Jerry Jewell. Because, you know, that that's the kind of thing that I'm not typically used to hearing Jerry Jewell as, and I, I thought that would be a really nice break of his usual character roles. Uh, but in any case, um, Dennis Obaji is played by Kyle Ignazi, and Mr. Zalata is played by Barry Andel. Uh, Kyle Ignazi, you would know as Inokita in Hakata Tonkatsu Ramens. He's Shin Koyo in uh, Hakyu Hoshin Engi. Yeah, I'm bringing that one up. Like, what a weird show that was. Like, I I recommend it just as a curiosity in how pacing of a show how can go m- wrong. I mean, Tokyo Ghoul re offers the same experience. True. Uh, he is Shun Hanamori in Cut of the Right Answer, and Ox- Axel Labu in Fairy God. Uh, Barry Yandel, you would know as Zaruba in all three entries of the Garo anime franchise. Uh, He's the little demon in Soul Eater. Uh, Yoki in both incarnations of Full Metal Alchemist. And he's Travis Murphy in Double Decker. He's also one of the more shocking Popco performances in Pop Team Epic. (laughs) Hmm. Yeah, I actually wrote Your life ends 30 minutes from now. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But Hardy, why don't you start us off on our bad guys? All right, well, um, I think, uh, no insult to Kyle Ignacy as an actor, I'm sure he's a wonderful human being, uh, Kyle kind of has a reputation of playing a Chad, these sort of charismatic douchebag, Excuse me, Fudo was never a Chad, he's just drunk. (laughs) Someone, someone take that bottle away from that small boy. But, uh, I mean, it's sort of like how Eric Vale has a reputation of always playing, like, like villains and rude people. Uh, Kyle, to no fault of his own, sort of is going down the same route. And mixed with this character, this character is a douche. And, like, he's bragging, like, oh, I could buy this for this much and this for this much. But you know how much I pay to get laid? Nothing. It's like $3 I could get a woman. And... This is the type of douchebag you just want to punch in the face. And Kyle plays him so convincingly. And and it's almost a shame that they gave him as much... He He's in the intro for a split second, so you think he's going to be more important than he is. And then they just kill him off in episode two. And I, kill him off in episode like three. Yeah, episode like, three, this right. This show has a reputation of just bringing characters into the op- opening that they just... They bump off. Yeah. Pretty much the same episode. Because he's not the only one. Because I think he could have been an actual charismatic villain, recurring villain, uh, and Talarna's foil when they have that fight. And uh, so I'm kind of, kind of upset that they bumped him off that quick. But for the brief moment that he was there, he definitely made an impression. Now, let's talk about Barry Andell. <laughs> Because if there's one thing Barry Andel is good at, it's playing creepy characters. And uh, and Zalada definitely is one. And he's one of the more dangerous ones that Barry has played in recent past. And so he just brings this sort of this mysticism and this mystery and also this sinister vibe. He just makes him sound so... Like like an evil witch doctor or sorcerer who knows exactly what you're after and he knows exactly how to deal with you. And I think that that's one of Barry's strengths is playing these really crafty villains with these evil intentions and, uh, and Zalata certainly is a good representation of that. So I think they both did very well. 
right. Also, I was practicing my Barry Andell impersonation before this episode, and it kind of goes with my Jimmy Stewart a little bit. So, <laughs> I reminded of Dana Carvey's uh, status, but yeah, do it again, whore. <laughs> Every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. Mm-hmm. But anyways, sorry. <laughs> Are you I okay? Feel, I feel unclean. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you know do they, it again. You know they make pancakes in hell. <laughs> <laughs> Smoke a lot of dope, don't you, boy? That was a rhetorical question. Anime dubs. We were talking about anime <laughs> dubs. That's right. <laughs> Kyle playing playing the loser of the fantasy name lottery. <laughs> it should be maybe the de- maybe given given his relationship to another crazy guy. Maybe the on point comparison would be Dennis Wilson from the Beach Boys. But anyways, um, yeah, no, that's me. I own Dennis Wilson's one solo album on CD. What do you want from me? Um, anyways, I liked him as Dennis. Um, he he just bought. He had that like good creepy, like Dennis. It, Dennis is a very unsettling character in general. Just kind of like you know he's he's you know he is he, an old scene where he's like manipulating the cops and um, he's just he's very good at like he just he nails that like I uh, like he's unsettling but there's a little charisma to him. Like he's he's he's. He's not quite entertaining to watch because of what he's doing, but you can kind of see like, oh, I, I understand why this person is like getting where he is. Like, I, I can, I can kind of piece the, you know, I can, I can see how he's gotten to where he is in life. Um, uh, da, da. um dude, he's, he's, he's just, he's, he's, he's a lot of, um, almost glee, I guess, in his, his performance. Like, it's, it's a character who's, who likes indulging in the fact that he's evil, and not a good person. I thought Kyle uh, Kyle brings that out very well. It's a, it's a he's a good fit for the role, and Barry uh, Barry's very good at playing weirdo, creepy people. And who what is and who is this if not but a weird, creepy person? Um, I'm a little. I'm a, you have to excuse me. It's been a while since I've seen this episode. So they're a little rusty in my mind, but I they were they were good, strong performances. I remember liking both of them. Um, it is, I, this is this is a question I have about this. Because I thought it was sort of weird that, like, the end of the first arc happens, like, a third of the way through episode four. Yeah, yeah. I was, this like, very this is, much, like, what the fuck? It, like, show's over. Bye, it, guys. Yeah, this, this is one of these things where I want to know, like, what is the plot of the individual light novels? Because I, I feel like they've... The, uh, I, like, cause in my mind, it's like, oh, that would have been, like, that could be, like, the plot of a book there. Except they randomly ended it in, like, a third of the way through one of the episodes for whatever reason. And so now, now, now it ends up being one of these things of like, uh, you know, maybe, you know, this character goes away so quickly because previously you had like 200 pages to enjoy them. But, you know, on TV, that's just like maybe 15 minutes combined, something like that, um, which is a shame because they're both entertaining performances. I would have been happy to see them stick around for a little bit longer. Um, but this is what happens when your one off light novel then becomes a series. And it's like, oh, man, I killed that guy. I could have used him. Shit. Oh, well. Guess I'll come up with somebody else. Skeevy politicians are still in, right? Yeah, I can do that. You could, you could always take the guilty crown approach and just bring the main bad guy back up to life for no apparent reason. We don't talk about guilty crown. I've never even seen it. And I know it's bad. It's um, a thing. It happened. It's an experience. Um, yeah, no, the, the, I, I, I like both of these performances. They're really strong. I, 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 I would have been happy to see them stick around for a little bit longer, but I really enjoyed what we did get. I was very sad that Kyle Ignacy's character died so fast. I was like, "Yay, Kyle Ignacy's in something I like again," because I like Kyle Ignacy's performances, like. He's always got some, like, energetic, like, he's got some, like, this weird energetic, like, side to him. Even, like, like, I I feel really weird because, like, the first thing I legitimately ever had to learn, like, who the fuck Kyle Ignacy was as a person was that he played a hard-drinking, like, 12-year-old sword. 
who like just got drunk and ran away from Aaron Roberts all day. And now he's That's here. That's right. Like, he assault- was the sword boy who ran the bar. Yeah, no, yeah, he was the one that gets like explicitly drunk and keeps crying and like almost gets drowned and Aaron goes and saves him. Um I love that he is such a fucking piece of shit. And his voice sounds like his voice sounds like a kid who's like drunk on white claw. Go. <laughs> There ain't no laws Fucking when you drink in a claw. claw. He says as he, he as he lets out a fairy nuke. Ain't no laws while you drink in the claw. Boom. <laughs> oh dear. Now dance on the hood. America. America. Oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> Come and dance in the motherfucking day. Yeah. <laughs> he would he would tell he would tell Talarna, uh. To, uh, to kiss his ass and suck on his balls. Like, um, he just... I think one of my favorite moments is like, Oh, I tricked you, bro! And she's just like, No, no, you didn't trick me at all. I knew it was you. Just like, he literally, sa- he literally like, feels like he was ripped off an episode of Law & Order SVU. Um... He also he also is into bad he's also into bad nineties movies like Earth Chicks are easy. Um which can I also talk about like the episode titles just being overt references to like shitty American things? Mmm, yeah. This, or like you know Western thing, like Girls on Ice, Girls on Film, Need for Speed. You know, you know, when I brought up when I brought up Samurai Cop, that was partially because the guy, the guy who made Samurai Cop was an Iranian filmmaker who clearly loved American movies, but didn't seem to have a very good grasp on what American culture was actually like. And the title in Cop Craft kind of reminds me of that. It's just like, ooh, Western stuff. To what yeah. end? No one's really sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Western stuff. <laughs> yeah. White Claws. Bed Bath & Beyond. <laughs> sportsmanship. <laughs> I can't believe that I've actually openly gotten a reference to American World Police. Um, <laughs> just Jesus Christ. Uh, I think that he was great. He was just such a little douche douche canoe as de- as, as a guy named Dennis. Um, and then Barry Andel did Barry Andel things. He was the creepy old man character with the fairy nuke, and I thought he went down pretty quick. I thought he was a. Uh, I thought he was very convincing in being subservient. And the whole, thank you, master. Like, thank you, master. I'm gonna just, you know, take this nuke and go blow up a bunch of rich people. Bye-bye. Uh, he did the creepy Barry Endell thing, so I can't complain. So, go ahead, honey. Hmm. Yeah, I I really like, um, Kyle Ignacy's Dennis. <laughs> like, I, I just... Like, he's, he's just playing this douchebag character named Dennis. I, but, you know, like, getting back into, like, out of jokey mode, I, I really like his interactions with uh, Talerna in episode three, where he's just like, oh, yeah, I, um, you like this place? I own it. And his whole speech about the religion of money like i i thought that was really well done you know where he's basically speaking like um the religion of humans is money and he managed to get a place in human society by basically acquiring capital and like all the little nuances to the performance there were just great. You got... I got goosebumps. And, um... I... Like probably everybody else who just spoke, I was kind of disappointed when they just kind of killed him off at the... at the end of episode 3. Because I thought there was... Like, the character itself had a lot of promise to it. Like... Acquiring a lot of money, buying a fairy bomb, and just 
doing bad things to people. Like, that was... I, I thought there was a little more they could do with him, and kind of bummed he got killed off. But Kyle Ignacy gave a really great performance there. Uh, now, Barry and Dell, I, I love the eerie vibe he gave Zalata. Like, through that initial first arc, and then... Um, and then again, when he shows up in episode five in an attempt to lead the the vampire girl to him so he could figure out about this book that I get the feeling is going to be the MacGuffin of the show. Like, he's trying to lead her away to where he is, and then she ends up getting hit by a subway. She got Oliver and companyed. <laughs> yeah. But I thought he had this really great kind of old, weary voice that just had this air of menace to it. Also, um, he's been tweeting about playing Zalata for a little while, and like, Wait, I get Barry the feeling Andel like has a fucking Twitter. Yeah, Barry Andel has a Twitter. Wait, what? And and he's just been talking about oh, like. Having a great time just speaking in this absolutely unique language. And, like, I get the feeling that he's really enjoying this, and you can tell. Uh, So, both of these villains had a great sense of charisma to them. They chewed the scenery. All in all, really great. Uh, So, with that, we will move to our two protagonists. Uh... Kei Matoba was originally a soldier with the uh, Japanese Self-Defense Force who ended up fighting a war with the uh, with the Samanians and coming back with really nasty PTSD episodes. And he ended up joining the San Teresa Police Force after his partner is killed in a... in an attempted raid to acquire the fairy that ultimately ended up becoming the fairy bomb, uh, he has to partner with a Simonian knight by the name of Talerna Exidilica. Uh, her name is actually, like, significantly longer, but it's, like, almost 11 and you're not gonna make me say it. She is a, she's a knight and a noble. She's sort of, it's sort of like that 300-year-old in a 16-year-old body, except it's not quite as bad. Because she's only, like... She's, she's like, like, 26... 18. Yeah, she's, like, 26 in her years, and she's, like, 18 in ours. Yeah. She's not really the 100-year-old lowly. She's just... She's just very petite. Right. But they end up getting into wacky misadventures involving magic and vampires and wizards and all sorts of good times. Mm -hmm. Scummy politicians. Right. <clears throat> Porn mags. Ones that like her keep her <laughs> socks on. Yes. Oof. Um, did, so it, did anybody have predictions for these two? I did. I did have predictions for these two. And, uh... I did as well. Mm-hmm. Alright, Hardy, why don't you start us off? Okay, I'll tell you who I wanted, but who I, I realized would never actually get it. Um, and this is because K. Matuba is literally an Asian-American. He is a Japanese man living in the United States, working right. as a police officer. And so, considering we were trying to be more uh, representative culture-wise, I actually wanted an Asian-American actor to play as him. Okay. Yeah. Now, looking at this character, I, cons I imagined a real low, gruff voice... And who do we know who's an Asian American actor with a low gruff voice? I think so, I see where you're going with this. I wanted KG Tang to play K Mataba. Okay. Ah. Now, now, 
Now, considering mm. he's in L.A., and while they can pull actors from L.A. to be in simuldubs, I knew that it was never going to happen, but I still wanted it anyways. And so, in that case, I also went to my default predictions of characters like this, which are Chris Sabat and Ian Sinclair. Okay. Yeah. And for Talarna, I had my defaults, which were Sarah Wiedenheff and Brent April, but I also kind of wanted to see Afia Yu play play this character. Okay, uh, so Megan, you also had some predictions? I did. Uh, for uh, for Kay, I should have done what Hardy didn't predict an Asian American actor, but I didn't. So I actually said Christopher Waycamp or J. Michael Tatum. And mm, for I could see uh, it. To Larna, I, I went with one super duper safe choice, and that was Jade Saxon. And then I went with Madeline Morris. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Holy crap. I think that was actually my same line of thought. <laughs> did did we mind couple mind meld? Possibly. Yay! <coughs> Alright, so for my predictions, I ended up doing what I wanted and what I expected. Uh, so for uh, K Matoba, um, the prediction that I wanted was Brandon Potter, but I was mm-hmm. also expecting Ian Sinclair. And for Talarna, I wanted Madeline Morris, and I expected Jade Saxon. There we go. We did mind meld on Talarna. Uh, in any case, um, K Matoba is being played by David Matranga. And Talerna Extilica is played by Fleet John Geo. Uh, David Matranga, you would know as Luke in Garo Vanishing Line. Uh, he is Ushio Aotsuki in Ushio and Tora. Uh, Captain Harlock in Harlock Space Captain. And he's also been announced to be reprising the role in um, Galaxy Express 999. I forgot which, which of the two movies... Uh, Discotech is dubbing, but he is reprising his role as Harlock in it. Mm-hmm. He's also Orphan from Orphan. He's also Orphan from Orphan. Mm-hmm. Um, but also uh, sort of um, an indie show, not really gaining any traction. Um, he's a character named Shoto Todoroki in Ooh. My Hero Academia. Sounds like a nerd. Mm. Sounds like a huge nerd. <laughs> uh, so Felicia Angel is um, Ikarma in Golden Kamui. She is Shinoa Hiragi in Seraph of the End. Uh, Makoto Harada in Space Battleship Yamato. And Aria in the uh, Vision of Escaflone. Redub. Right, the uh, the Funimation redub from a few years ago. All right, so Hardy, why don't you start us off? Okay, um, let's see here. A lot of people might not be familiar. I, I gotta say, Matrango was not my first choice for this role, but a lot of people might not be familiar with him playing roles sort of like this. But then you got to remember, Sayuki is a thing. Mm, yeah. Yes, where he played. Uh, I believe the name was Gojo Senzo or something like that, where he was this sort of chain-smoking, revolver-packing monk who had a smart mouth on him and an itchy trigger finger. And this brings back a lot of Sayuki vibes, like big time. And which is ironic, which not ironic, but it's funny considering just last year he got to actually reprise that role. Uh, in Under Sayuki, Jeremy Inman. New... Under Jeremy Inman, you're right. And so, while I think more new fans are familiar with Matranga's new roles, such as Todoroki, he's more soft-spoken, yeah, this uh, this definitely harkens back to the old ADV days of um, sass and, and, and uh, you know, whip-crack sort of humor. So I think Dave does a really good job with that. And, uh, and his one-liners are just oh-so-perfect. Um, I also think Felicia 
does really good as Talarna specifically because she's this is like her character from Devil is a Part Timer in a lot of ways. Sort of this visitor from another world, stuck in the human world, uh, has to speak her own fairy tale language, um, very prim and proper, and is quite not exactly used to how things are, handle over on this side just yet. So she gets flustered and confused and 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 angry a lot, and has lots of arguments with her partner, and. Uh, it's a uh, when I was first watching Devil's a Part Timer. I admit I was not the biggest fan of Felicia's performance. This I like. I think she's improved immensely since then, and uh, and I think she she just she turns to Larda into this little spunky little porcelain doll. It's just so adorable, and we like to see her get flustered and play with the cats and 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 <laughs> and read poor magazines. <laughs> So, so yeah, I, I, I really like the chemistry between these two as they constantly go back and forth and bicker and have good old 80s buddy cop movie moments. So, that's all I gotta say. Hmm. It's weird hearing Todoroki swear. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll ignore the fact that he doesn't really sound like Todoroki when he was playing um, K, okay, but I, D- Dave's a lot of fun in this. He is the exact right kind of like obnoxious asshole for this role. He's really mean, but somehow it it it, it it's 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 always kind of right in the ballpark of like fun mean never gets like too cruel or anything. It's he's not he's not like super unpleasant, which I think is we're going to be following around for the whole show. That's important. Uh, but Dave's just, he's clearly having a lot of fun playing this guy. He's so just world weary and obnoxious and so tired of this and he wants this lady to stop living in his apartment where she keeps letting cats in which he's allergic to until he's not and uh and we are we already talked about the bit with the car um and and the bit with the with the porn mags where he's oh, arguing no, I with go the one guy with about the car. i want right, to go in depth with the car like that's my thing please all right. In that case, I I just I don't have any more in depth, but just the 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 height of delight is him and the other officer just arguing about basically like what is kinky exactly? My girlfriend wouldn't do this. Your girlfriend ain't shit, then, buddy. <laughs> get a get a harder girlfriend. Um, he's he's so he's so like the just the just the right on point kind of sleazy for this character. Um. Yeah, it's great. I, again, like I can, I can see him starring in some movie that's on TNT at three in the afternoon on a Sunday. It's sunny out. I'm gonna watch explosions and gunfights for two hours. It's gonna be a fun time. Um, yeah, he, he, exactly. He's just he's a he's a he's a hoot here, and um, Leisha's also a lot of fun as Tirana. Um, she she because she nails the very like prim properness a lot, but she is. That she's still like really funny, um, you know her her being scandalized by the porn mags, but then not really being able to you know stop looking at it now that she's picked it up. Um, <laughs> she's just blushing as she flips the page, and it's like, oh, honey. Yeah, uh, oh. Can, can we make a comment on the names of the magazines? Oh, the names of the porn mags are wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> like what were I? I missed like I was watching, but I also well, missed some of them. Like one of we them's had, like. Uh, Prayboy, 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 Pont House, and Hustlar. <laughs> it's, like the of, it's like the McDonald's of porn. Exactly. I think there's at least one more in there that I didn't catch, but I, I, I'm pretty sure is also riffing on another. Like, I want to say there was like a jugs with two G's. Yeah, exactly. It's They did their research. <laughs> 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 they paid someone five dollars to go to a Seven Eleven and sit in L.A. <laughs> and tell them what are the dirty magazines behind the counter called? We need it for research purposes. Oh, hey boy, it's... go to the Kona store <laughs> and buy us some pornographic magazines. <laughs> Here's ten dollars. Oh. Which is probably going to get you, like, <coughs> one pornographic magazine. Um, but back to Felicia. Um, no, she's, she's really funny in this role. Um, 
she just she she nails the beats really well. Um, I also like her when she finally gets a chance to drive, and is just at, at, at abs. Is this what going fast? What is it? Is this what going fast is like? Is this what speed is like? I forget the line, but it was like, oh no, what have you done? <laughs> I'm I'm also waiting for the episode where like. Somebody from back home comes to check on her and is just scandalized by how Earth-like she is now. Oh. We have created a vehicular manslaughter. Basically. Um, but I, I also think she, she she has, like, um, you know, Tarana has, like, softer moments as well. I especially liked a lot of her um, her stuff with um, What's Her Name from Episode 7. Which I thought was done really well, and it was just fun. Oh, uh, I'm blanking on the character's oh, name. Oh, Zoe? Yeah, exactly. Um, just like I, I like, I like their interaction a lot. It was nice. It was fun seeing her like interact with somebody outside of um, K for a little bit. Um, I'm also, you know, spoiler, spoiler. Um, you know, that, she, she was just a very strong role, and I think the two of them together work really well off of each other. Like they're a good, they are a good buddy cop duo for this buddy cop show. Um, they have really good interplay together. And I'm just re- like I'm just re- I've been really happy with their performances so far. I feel like even like the the supporting cast is very strong. I think for the most part, um, but I feel like even if the supporting cast was a lot less interesting to watch, I feel like I could continue watching just for these two. I think they're really they're just a really good set. I think. So like, I didn't expect Dave to be this, and this is really weird because like Dave's in a lot of anime that I'm watching this season, like. <laughs> He's a surprising amount of things I'm in, I'm watching this season, but uh, I think for me the thing I like most about K is that he is such a fucking piece of shit. Like he swears, he drinks, he's allergic to his own cat, and then he's suddenly not allergic. Which God, that line, you asshole! But I I thought he was fine. I thought he was. He was just like, this is a really serviceable... Then comes episode 6 where he starts screaming and crying about his car. And Dave just loses it about the car. <laughs> that thing was the only thing that ever loved me! And like, it is like borderline like hysterical crying. And then the thing that gets me more about it is that he, when he says, fine, you can go to the auction and get a new car, how he immediately just goes back to normal. <laughs> like, it was a, such an act. It was, it was the old Viva Pinata commercial. That was acting, children. Ha ha. <laughs> I remember that. Thank you to all of you who are a 90s child and understand shitty things I reference. Um, but, like, I think the other the other line was, um, have fun with Cecil, see you later, nerd! <laughs> Where he's got the car and he drives off. And then the kicker at the end, it's where he sees the car, the new car he's gotten, has gotten destroyed again, right? Yep. And yeah. just Dave's delivery of, uh, don't worry, there's just some damage. We can get it fixed. And then the car just bursts into flames. As if to cosmically smite K. Mataba for his actions. And just Felicia... It looks like it's... <laughs> and then, like... Yo, you're gonna do it. You go. Felicia's delivery of... So can the damage still be fixed? And he's just like... <laughs> and he just gives, like, the, oh, fuck you of reactions. Can we fix it? No. no. It's fucked. No. Bob the Builder, K the Driver, can we fix it? K the Driver, no, we can't. <laughs> and then nope. Felicia as Talarna reminds me, she is Shinola with a stick up her ass. That's what her perform. Like, <laughs> I love, I love Talarna, and I really love. Um, I want to give credit to the actress who does play Zoe in Episode Eight, Kimberly Grace. Who does a phenomenal job as a one episode wonder? Her and Talarna is like back and forth, and when Talarna's got to come to cut terms with, well, if she was on the side of justice, then she would totally be okay with me just being a cop. And how she has to kind of have this vulnerability to her because Talarna doesn't really let her walls down a ton, but when she does, it's usually like, a, oh, I have to understand other people, 
because she doesn't have the same viewpoint as the humans do and her social expectations are like 100% different from, from ours. But I think that Felicia nails it. I think this is one of Felicia's uh, like best performances of the year that I... And she's in a lot of shows this season too. Like She is in like four different shows we are doing episodes on. And at least three of them she plays the female It's a major lead. character. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she's uh, the female lead in this. She's the female... She's a, a big player character in another sh- a show. Um, she is the, the only female character in another show. Um, and then I... And then she's... Okay, yeah. And then she's a, another major ensemble piece in another show. So, like... Yeah, Felicia's... Good job, Limerick! <laughs> oh lord, she coming! <laughs> oh lord, it's a lot of coming. I, I I love it to death. I love the, the, the chemistry between the two actors. Like, obviously ADR work doesn't always me- mean that these people don't always record at the same time, but there is just something there that I didn't get from the Japanese version of the show. Like... I watched maybe two episodes of the show in the sub before exclusively turning over to the dub. And I think that a big reason for it is just that uh, Dave and Felicia rock it as Kay and Talarna. Yeah. Um, I I really like the chemistry between um, David and Felicia. Like, holy crap. This... This entire show predicates on the fact that these two hate each other's guts and then slowly turn around and just first put up with each other and then get along and now they're like actually, by episode six, like they actually care about each other. In some little form or fashion at least. In between, there are little moments, like, Kay using being angry at Talarna in order to manipulate things so that he can get a new car after his old one is wrecked. He's not afraid to... Kay's a character who is not afraid to just kind of manipulate people a little bit. Gently. Just a nudge. Just a little nudge. But, um... I I like how he goes goes from deathly serious through the first episode to the entire comedic freaking out over his car being destroyed in episode six. Uh, absolutely flust like joking around about how Talerna is getting flustered at human pornography to basically being her shield when shit hits a fan. And on Felicia's end is Talarna. Uh, she goes from being sort of a sort of a Sundari warrior to like actually busting chops and being a cop like the others. And like it's a really great dynamic. I I really enjoyed both performances, and I think the chemistry between David Matranga and Felicia Angio is what holds the dub of the show together. So, great job to the both of them. Thumbs up. So I think now is the time where we will move on to final thoughts. So, Hardy, what did you think of Copcraft? Uh... Well, as a show, it has some significant problems. Let's be perfectly real here. Right. Uh, the, the animation sort of falls apart around episode three, and as of right now, still has not gotten its footing back yet. Hopefully, it will have enough support for them to go back for the Blu-ray release and correct a lot of the issues that the animation has. The first two episodes are great, no, but after that, things start to fall apart, and at times it can be a bit of a mess. That said, it is a very entertaining mess. It is my kind of mess. 
Um, it's not, I wouldn't go so far as to call it trash, but it's got its problems in the animation, a few problems with the story itself. Uh, it is not a show for everyone. Some people might be turned off against the uh, not so subtle hints of racism and uh, some of the more cringier elements such as Talarna's figure and some of the outfits she's put in and some of the things, the situations she's put in um, might be a little cringy considering her appearance. And also there's, there is quite a bit of, uh, of sometimes graphic violence and lots of adult humor. So it is not a show for everyone. However, if you like your your eighties, your late eighties, early nineties buddy cop movies with a little bit of fantasy element stuck into it, give it a shot. It's not a hundred percent hit, but you're in for a good time. Okay, um, I'm on. What are your th- final thoughts? <clears throat> No, I, I, I feel I feel like um, I fall in sort of a similar opinion. Uh, this is not a this is not a perfect show. It has kind of obvious flaws to it in both um, the sort of the way, it, the way it's been animated and stuff in the story and so on. But I've gen- like I've been enjoying it a lot. Uh, it's not it's not a hundred percent on the pandering directly to Amon scale, but it's in a like a good sixty five like junky action show. Needs more skeletons and 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 panthers shooting light lasers. I think. Look, 100 on the Amon scale is Chainsaw Man. Ah, yes. So, it could use those. Those would be good. Um, that being said, like, I'm enjoying this a lot. I think the dub is definitely helping with that. I think the dub captures the uh, the vibe of the show really well in that sort of, um, sort of you know, mid- mid-budget buddy comedy from the 80s. Something, something that wants to be Lethal Weapon, even though it's probably not going to be that good. Um... Like the cast is, I think the casting is very strong. I think the actors play their roles really well. They're given, they're when they're given good stuff to work with, they turn in really entertaining performances. Um, yeah, like this, this is this is very much like this is not going to probably not going to get any of my dubbies at the end of the year. But I could also see myself like watching this all the way in the end, assuming it doesn't take like some really, really assuming you know the animation doesn't get real bad or something like that. Um, yeah, no, like, I, I'm enjoying it, and I think if this if this sounds like the kind of thing that you get a kick out of, I would recommend giving this a shot. It's It's been a fun ride. Okay. Uh, Megan, your final thoughts? I think that I'm with Amon. I don't think this is going to get any of my dubbies, personally. I think that uh, Jeremy does a good job of getting a cast together that does represent uh, the characters in the show. I think that Dave and Felicia are a riot as Talarna and Kay. Um, I think the script is great. I do think that this is a show that yeah, like, people aren't going to like it, whether it be the animation issue, whether it be um, Talarna. Like, I could say this because I, I, I read this on a and They did a, a, a I love reading a um This Week in Anime is X Worth Watching because some of them have some of my absolute favorite fucking quips. Like, uh, nobody wants to be on a team with Shinji Mato from Run With The Wind is one of my personal favorites. Uh, but one of the things that I do know is that there's an episode where Talarna gets um, body swapped with a cat and her human body pisses in a box. And that's just weird. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, so if, what? like, there, there's... <laughs> Hamon, are you Okay. I wasn't expecting Amon? that. That was very su- that was very surprising. <laughs> Just oh yeah, and a Talorna pees in a box. Talorna, a cat using Talorna's body pisses in its box. That's a thing, and that's kind of creepy. And I don't want to see, I don't want to see that. Like, ew. Um, and that's still only the second worst. A character with cat features gets treated in an anime this year, this season. Um. But I think that this is a fun dub to watch. This is definitely one of those, like, hey, this isn't, like, the greatest dub ever. But this is also not a dub that is god-awful, turn it off, my ears are bleeding. Like, I think it's it's a dub that's enjoyable and fun to watch for fans. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep up with this one. This is not a show that I'm gonna drop uh, after I've done the episode, so. Go ahead. Okay. Um... <coughs> 
this was a dub I really enjoyed. Um, like everyone else here, I'm not 100% sure if this ends up getting any of my dubbies, but it's... Like, at the moment, there are one or two that it's a contender for. Um, I think the the comedy hit when it was supposed to. The dramatic scenes were fairly well done. Um, definitely significantly more hits than misses. Um, well, I do think the sort of racism subplot of the show is a little ham-fisted. At least it does a better job with it than Bright. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this, real, this really is kind of the good version of Bright, isn't it? Pretty much. <laughs> so if it's... I, if you were moderately interested in seeing Bright, but you're like, eh, man, No. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is a good alternative. Uh, but the dub is really solid. A great ensemble cast. Um, really fun, plays off of its 80s tropes, like it, like it's his job, and just an absolute blast. Uh, the show is definitely not for everybody, um, like we warned, the animation falls apart a lot, and, you know, it's, it's very violent when it, <clears throat> when it needs to be, and... That may not be everybody's cup of tea, but if you don't mind that, this is a dub I will very heartily recommend. And if you want to see the dub of Copcraft, it is made available on Funimation. Uh, right now, you can get a month subscription for $7.99 a month. And if you sign up, you get a two-week free trial. If the service isn't your jam... Like, do be sure to cancel it at that point, because you do need to give your credit card information, and if you keep it any longer than the two-week free trial, they will charge you. And if that's not something you want, don't do it. Um, the sub is currently also available via Hulu. I would assume the dub will also find its way over there eventually. Uh, not to mention an inevitable home video release probably sometime next year or, like, 2021. Alright, so we have a bunch of $10 patrons that we would like to thank. Uh, we have to us... do the 5 and the, tw the, five and the 10. Alright, um, we will start with the $10 patrons. Uh, big shout out to Marissa Lenti, Jacob Wilson... Uh, Sheridan Valadek, um, Weeby, Carly Lestikow, uh, Jared, Brad Mitchell, and also a big thanks to our $5 patrons, Michelle Travis, and Nico Robin with the Alley Hands. Um, if you would like to see what we are up to as Dub Talk, um, if you are watching this via our YouTube channel, there's a little... Subscribe button and bell icon to the bottom right of the video. Go ahead and click those. See what happens. You never know. We dare you. We triple dog dare you. Uh, we also have a Twitter and a Twitch at Duptop Podcast. Um, we're trying to figure out what we're doing with the Twitch account at the moment, but we will probably have some live streams going at some point. Um, so with that, do we have any projects we would like to plug? Starting with you, Hardy. Uh, I'm Spaceman Hardy. You can find me at Spaceman Hardy on Twitter. I basically just rant a whole lot and post, ret retweet pictures and post goats. Uh, I'm also a moderator over at the Funimation forums and the Discord. So come on by and, uh, hang out with me. All right. Um, Amon, uh, do you have plugs? And please tell me you also have a dusty song. Yes and yes. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at AmonDuelUS. Duel is two using it. I talk about uh, movies and comic books and music and 
uh, gushing about the Steven Universe movie and how it made, has a secret appearance by a band I like, which was very exciting. Um, for my dusty old song, I wanted to get something uh, buddy cop related, or at least buddy cop adjacent. Uh, if you want something that's more pure cop adjacent, I recommend the theme song to the show of Barney Miller, which is a fun little uh, funky instrumental. Um, but since I don't even know if there's a full-length version of that, um, you follow the train of thought now. Uh, the general agree, the buddy cop genre is generally agreed to have started with uh, 48 Hours, which is directed by Walter Hill. Now, I've not seen that movie, but I have seen Walter Hill's greatest achievement, The Warriors. And if you've seen The Warriors... If you've seen the worries, you may remember a very memorable scene where the uh, sort of the uh, the Greek choir of the show, this uh, late night radio DJ, uh, gives an announcement to the warriors, basically that everyone is uh, gunning for them. And this is accompanied by a cover of uh, the song "Nowhere to Run," done by a singer named Arnold McCuller. And it's a it's a it's a very good cover. It works very well in that movie. I highly recommend tracking it down. It is excellent. And my dusty old song contribution is "F the Police" by Ice Cube. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Hardy. Yes. All right, uh, Megan. Do you have anything you'd like to plug? I'm your girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I'd like to plug that. I'd wish this cough would go the fuck away. Um. <coughs> my name is Megan. You can follow me on Twitter at Cornier Two, where I shit post post pictures of my very needy needy cookie dog Bailey. My wonderful cat, Shinya, who I think was in my room at one point, and I didn't let her in. And I just looked down, and we almost had an inc- we almost had an UBW incident again. Um, but you can find me talking about things and, sc- and crying about gay Chinese necromancers, which you can legally watch on YouTube now. Yay! Woo! Please watch Mad Um, woo! It's Zamboni time! Deba 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 deba. <laughs> Them Zambies. Um, it's Zambies. It's the Zambonies. <laughs> I miss I miss Logan so very much. <laughs> I miss Beth and Logan very much, and and Stryker, but not you, Crimson. Get get your get your mind out of them big titty Doctor Goth gutters. Uh, I'm kidding. I love you, Crimson. I love you, Crimson. Please be safe, because I know you're going through Dorian, coming up your up brazen past you right now. Uh, but yeah, I, I shit post and I talk about how much I love my boyfriend, who is a very sweet, good boy, who has to put up with my bullshit. Okay. Um, so, I am Roots of Justice. You can find me on Twitter at Roots of Justice, where I mainly just retweet cute animal pics, talk about general fandom. Right now, my focus is on Dark Crystal Age of Resistance. Hup is best boy. Um, also, Fizz Gig. Oh, yeah. Don't forget about the Fizz Gig. Um, I may end up cutting this if it doesn't end up panning out, but I am looking into uh, returning to reviewing for the fandom posts. So look forward to that, maybe. We'll see. Uh, so with that, I think the Copcraft episode of Dub Talk is complete. Mm-hmm. Let's all return to base so we can file, <laughs> we can do the one thing all cops hate the most. Paperwork. 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 <laughs> my nemesis. Joke's on you. Joke's on you. I finished all my paperwork already. I have to file my report. I have to help the boss make that stupid make mascot he designed for the station. <laughs> I have to run and I get out sweaty. I have to go talk about how Andrew can't eat chicken like a human. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good I... lord, man. Fork and knife. Fork and knife. <laughs> Andrew, arrested for chicken eating crimes. Oh, yes. boy. That's uh, better than his uh, his fish eating crimes, which you know his phrase, fuck him and eat him. <laughs> All right. Remember, uh, Andrew's, so only, before... Andrew's only allowed to eat tacos like an animal. All right, all right, kids. You can't uh... arrest me, Steph. Not if you can't find me. <laughs> Catch me if you can. So from us, from Dub Talk to you, have a great evening. 
and Otaku on there, Devas. Keep it manly. Rock on Boston, rock on Cleveland. Haha, <laughs> <laughs> you'll never catch me! I've disguised myself as a pilot! <laughs> Can we stop recording now? Uh, 15 years ago, an unknown hyperspace gate opened over the Pacific. The specific... Okay, let me try that one more time. Be be specific, (laughs) name the Pacific. (laughs) He is also um, Anubis in the video games. Blah. Blah, 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 blah.